Good morning, Full Devotion FBC family. We are excited to begin our worship today with our very own King's Kids. So as you come down and sit down as you're joining us online, let's worship the Lord together this morning. The Lord is my strength and my shield, Psalms 28.7. Can you hear me? There it is. The bigger they come, the harder they fall. I love that. Just a couple announcements for you this morning. Welcome to those here in person and those joining us online. Uh, first announcement, this Friday is our Taiwan On event. Uh, the missions team has been working very hard to make this an awesome event for all of us. Uh, come and join us. The admission, you have to wear something green and bring a green dessert, but it will be a fun night. Uh, next up, we have started our Easter candy donation. We are in need of small, individually wrapped candies uh, that can fit into plastic eggs. You can place those on the table in the foyer, and you can also make a monetary donation and just mark candy on the memo line. The Easter egg hunt is Saturday, April 8th. We do have flyers and uh, cards available that you can hand out. Invite the kids you know and your family, the neighborhood, uh, take them to school. The Easter egg hunt is 11 to 12.30, Saturday, April 8th. On the flyer, there is a QR code, so if they want to use that for registration, they can scan that and that will uh, register them for the Easter egg hunt. Last but not least, uh, women's retreat, April 1st. Registration for deadline is March 22nd. Ladies, join us as we attend a one-day retreat at Diamond Hills Baptist Church in Mansfield. Cost is $20. Flyers and registration forms are on the info table.
Thank you. For those of you who don't know, that is Davina, our youth director, and good to have her share those announcements with us this morning. I want to invite you into an opportunity where we worship God through our giving, and we do through a number of ways. Our offering plates are there at the back of the sanctuary as you come in. For those of you that are joining us online, or even those of you that may be technologically savvy, you may give through the app. And I just want to highlight this morning, if you do not have the full devotion app, we encourage you to go to the Google Play Store or the Apple iStore and, and get the full devotion app. Type that all in, one word together, no space, and look for the purple tree that is our logo and our graphic. And we've been updating things on the app this week, and in fact, one of the things you can do there, if you open that up, the front page, it takes you immediately to the Easter egg graphic, and then you can go into the registration site when you click on that. You can also follow uh, the sermon notes online. Uh, just a lot of great content that's being updated and added to that. I don't want anybody to miss it. But you can give through the app. You can give through our electronic giving on the website. Or you certainly can mail those gifts into the church. As we give this morning, we know that we have received an inheritance from the Lord. For those of us who have committed our life to Jesus Christ, who have trusted in him as Savior and as Lord, and who are being led by his Spirit and being transformed by his Spirit, the Bible promises us this, uh, this eternal reward, reward, eternal reward, this incredible gift uh, in heaven with God and with Jesus Christ. And as I always say, whatever the Son gets in his inheritance, Jesus Christ, we get as well because uh, we are co-heirs with Christ. I think that's always pretty awesome to think about. Uh, because of that gift that God has given to us of eternal life, we give back to him a portion of that which we receive, and we do that through our offering. I want to ask God's blessing upon our offering this morning and invite you into prayer as we also lift up those in our church who are in need this morning. Gracious God, we come before you because you are righteous and holy and there is none like you. You are the one who has created us, the one who sustains us, the one who guides us through our daily living. And yes, Father, there are days where it's hard. Uh, it, it, it's hard because of whatever circumstances life may be throwing at us. It may be as as uh, it was this morning having to get up an hour earlier because we had to set our clocks ahead or it may be the struggles in a relationship the struggles at work the struggles financially there's just a lot of factors our health even plays into it whether we're feeling good or not feeling so good and so Lord we thank you for the promise that you you'll never leave us you'll never forsake us you are with us always even to the very end of the age that you promised that in this world we will have trials and tribulations but take heart you've overcome those trials and tribulations for us you give us hope on this earth you give us peace on this earth not as the world hopes for or the peace the world desires but only what you can give through the transforming power of your spirit so we're thankful for that father we lay before you our gifts at your throne room this morning figuratively and literally through the giving of our offerings and who we are as individuals, we present ourselves to you once again. Father, renew in us a right spirit. Help us to bring our sins of confession up to date with you, knowing that your grace abounds, that our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. Father, we ask for continued guidance for our missionaries, David and Tiffany and their family, as they serve you and as they create languages in the heart language of the people in Papua New Guinea where they serve, Father. Thank you for Wycliffe Ministries and what they mean and what they do. Guide their parenting with their children and provide for their physical, emotional, and financial needs, Father. And May they sense this morning, we as a church body, praying for them. Father, for Ken and Linda Young, we continue to ask that you would guide and direct them through the struggles, especially with Ken's health. Lord, you sustain him, and you give Linda all that she needs to help care for the household and to take care of daily needs, which I know at times that list may be long and, and difficult to get through, providing for grandkids and all those things. Uh, but Lord, we thank you for their faithfulness and ask your blessing upon them. For the Harriman family, Becky and David, Father, this morning, grieving the loss of a father for her mom, Gladys. And father, as they recall a man who lived his life to serve others and loved you and we believe was born again a believer in Jesus Christ for John we thank you that his suffering has ended and then when he closed his eyes this last week midweek 
He opened them immediately into the presence of the kingdom of heaven that we spoke about this morning. And God, you welcomed him home. Arms wide open. So guide and comfort them as they go through the services and the grieving process. Father, for those in our church with health concerns, we want to continue to pray for John in his hospital stay and for Tawana, his beloved wife. We know it's been a struggle. We know that both heart concerns, kidney concerns are at the forefront. And so, Father, we celebrate tomorrow his birthday. We want to wish him a happy birthday. If he's joining us online this morning or able to tune in later, John, uh, we love you. We care about you. We're praying for you. We hope that you'll be able to be released tomorrow and to go home. Uh, and may God continue to, to guide and to lead you and Tawana both. Father, for Jody, uh, facing a possible back surgery, we ask that you give the doctors clarity tomorrow as she meets with them. And Father, for each and every other person on our list today, you know their needs, you know their heart. And Father, you're able to, you're able to love on them in a way that we can't, and yet we're able to come along and love on them in a physical presence in a way that you can. And together as the body of Christ, we're doing exactly what you've called us to do, to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, Lord, may you sense that love that we give to you today through our worship, because worship is not about us. It's not about the praise team. It's not about the, the instruments. It's not about the lights, but it is truly all of it coming together to worship you, because worship means you're worth it, God. Being here is worth something to us, something that cannot be given to us by the world, something that the world cannot replace, but only you, the sustainer of who we are as disciples growing in full devotion to Christ, are given through your mercy, through your grace, and the transformative power of your spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Oh, yeah. I know it's, we all lost an hour last night. But it's time to just kind of get things going and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We worship you, Lord.
Christianese saying that you have, that you've heard a hundred times, um, and just kind of, just that reckless love, you know, he, he comes after us. He, he, he leaves the 99. He leaves us believers to go after the non-believers sometimes, although he never really leaves us. And um, we just started doing this song a couple a couple weeks ago. Um, and once you've experienced that, if you haven't experienced that, I would really recommend looking hard, becoming born again. Kevin will, Pastor Kevin will tell you all about that. But it's, it's so important to do that, to receive Christ into your heart. And when you do that, you are never alone. Never alone. Because even when you're facing trials and the storms are going like this and, and you're standing in the midst of fire, there is another. There's another in the fire. Count the joy, come every battle. 
Worship at this time. All of our kids are dismissed with Joe and Linda, I believe, this morning helping them out. As we continue our study in the Gospel of John this morning, before we get there, let me share a few thoughts with you. One is, you know, what a great song by Corey Asbury, Reckless Love. I love the message behind that song, Leave the 99 to Go After the One. In fact, uh, some of our kids that are with us on Wednesday night have discovered over this year a couple times we have, uh, they like to play the game Find the Sheep, Find the Lamb that we hide in the building, and then they go seeking after the lamb as a reminder of that great passage that Jesus leaves the 99 to go after the one. Uh, just great words. And if God is going after you this morning because you're that one, I pray that he reaches you and challenges you and guides you into a new journey, a new transformative life. The other thing quickly this morning is that I was reminded from Mickey, who's with us online this morning, she's not feeling well in our missions group. Uh, along with the tie-dye, the tie event, tie one on is a tie-dye event, I believe, on Friday night. So if you want to bring a t-shirt and you want to transform it uh, into some other kind of artwork, go ahead and do that. Now, for those of you joining us online and those of you in service, you have your bulletin outline. Um, let me just walk you through real quick. If you have our app, down at the bottom of the menu, you can click on connect. And then that will take you to Sundays. Click on that one, and then Sermon Notes, and right there at the top will be our digital form of our notes for this morning in which you can fill out, and you can add your own notes and save that for you. Pretty, pretty neat feature we have. Those of you joining us online, let us know how we can be of help to you this morning. We can pray to you. Give us a thumbs up, a smile, or something there in one of the emojis uh, as we connect with you. As you are part of our church and part of our family, we always want to acknowledge you. Now, those of you that know a little bit about me know that I grew up a couple hours west of here in Marion County, Ohio, uh, all through my educational years. Marion's known as a farming community centered around agriculture, but I was raised in the city part of the county, Marion City itself, and so like most of my classmates as I went through school, we knew very little about farming or a farmer's way of life. But when I got to high school and in my sophomore year, we had a very interesting way of starting class every Monday with my English teacher. He himself, being raised on a farm and still living on the family property, had access to all kinds of like these little gadgets and tools and devices that were used in farming. Being a good teacher and looking for a way to connect with his students, he would bring in one of those items every Monday and he would show it to us, and then we would have a few minutes to ask questions and try to discover what it was or what it was used for. We got to play detective somewhat, and he would answer back, and, and, and this interaction might go on for like five to seven minutes if he allowed it. 
And most of the time, the class would give up because 99% of us had no idea what the item was or how it was used. We had little knowledge of what it actually was. And then our teacher would give us the answer. And he would, if able, show us a demonstration of how that device might be used on the farm with uh, planting or working with animals, horses, pigs, whatever it might be. Sometimes we would have that, I would call it that eureka moment, that aha, that moment like, oh, I get it, insight, knowledge, a new understanding of, of how this could be used. Or often we would be just as confused as we were before this whole process began. Even though he was a great teacher and had a good answer for us, we still did not comprehend what he was trying to teach us. So is our passage that we find ourselves in this morning in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. I encourage you to turn to your Bibles, turn to your Bible app. Now, as I've stated before, as we go throughout this study of the Gospel of John, we understand his purpose is evangelistic. It's to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And in this passage today, we find the description of what it means to come to know Christ, to come to know God through Christ as our Savior and our Lord, and as the passage is going to tell us, and Bob's alluded to it, that term in our Christian circles of being born again. Now, we need a little background here on Nicodemus and understanding who Nicodemus is in this passage. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He is one of those religious elites. And as John moves us into this interaction between Nicodemus, the Pharisee, and Jesus, the rabbi or the teacher, what it means for Nicodemus in being a religious elite is that he is, literally the term Pharisee means separated one, or one who has in many ways separated themselves from the ongoings of daily life in a society to ensure or to guarantee that he keeps all the rules or the regulations of the Jewish law, even down to the minute detail. Now we also know that Pharisees represented the upper class, and they themselves were socially respectable, economically privileged, and within Jewish society, they lived a good life, while many other people were in dire poverty. They were some pretty powerful people, these rulers of the Jews. They were put in position or given the authority uh, as the Sanhedrin or the great council of Pharisees, you know, comprised of about 70 individuals, much as we would look at the Supreme Court today. So in terms of perks, in terms of wealth, in terms of power, in terms of position, they were set for life. They didn't have to worry about hardly anything. And being under Roman rule, Rome used them to keep Jews, the Jewish society in place, the people, the masses in check. So what do you remember about the Sanhedrin? Well, if you recall, Jesus will go before who? Come that time when he's arrested. The Sanhedrin. Peter and John, and we've preached this message before, when they're when they're sharing the gospel, when they're preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, and they, they themselves are arrested, who do they go before? The Sanhedrin. What about Stephen? Stephen, who is what? The martyr, who is preaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he himself goes before the Sanhedrin, before he is eventually stoned to death. And then we know one Pharisee himself, who is called Saul. Saul, the one who had the conversion experience on the road to Damascus with Jesus and became Paul the Apostle, was much like Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus understood his faith in terms of keeping the law, in terms of how well he followed Jewish religion and rituals and requirements. And so we pick up this package, passage of Scripture understanding that Nicodemus is going to go to Jesus at night because, one, he wants to do this in somewhat of a discreet manner, being a 
Pharisee of the Sanhedrin. The other is that Jesus is often surrounded by masses of people during the day, so at night gives them an opportunity to be more alone uh, with him and to ask him an important question. And according to John's Gospel, this is the first encounter that Nicodemus has with Jesus. And let's read here, because we're going to find out that Nicodemus is impressed by Jesus, he's impressed by his teaching, he's impressed by his miracles and signs and wonders. He believes somewhat that there is a movement from God here, but he's not sure exactly what it is. He's not ready to commit himself to Jesus completely. He's not all in, and maybe that's where some of you are this morning. You understand a little bit about Jesus, you believe in some of the things that you read in Scripture, but you're not quite yet sure about committing yourself to Jesus in the terms that he uses this morning in this passage of Scripture. And we know for Nicodemus, he's not quite ready yet because he's going to lose his position of power. He's going to lose all those benefits of wealth and stature and respect and all those things. So he comes by Jesus tonight, by night, and we read, A man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council, comes to Jesus at night, and he asks him this question. Rabbi, meaning teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform these signs that you are doing if God were not with him or if God were not in him, if God was not behind the reason why these things are happening. And Jesus replied. Now you're going to hear a phrase here a few times in this passage of Scripture that John uses called very truly. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus is going to say something that's very important to us. So as we see that proceed, the passage that we're reading, take note. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again, Nicodemus. Of course, Nicodemus is a little confused by this term. He asks the question, how can someone be born when they are old? I mean, that makes sense to us, right? How do you get born again if you're old? Surely you cannot enter a second time into your mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, here's that phrase, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. For flesh gives birth to flesh, talking about natural birth, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. So you, Nicodemus, should not be surprised by my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Well, how can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. Pray with me. God, these words that we've read this morning are so vital and crucial to our understanding of what it means to follow you. And I pray now that these words that John has given us and the words that you've laid upon my heart, they're not my words, they're your words, Father, for you to be at work in the hearts of your people. As Jesus said, very truly I tell you, this is important for us to take notice this morning, the truth behind this scripture and behind the teaching of Jesus that we may not understand or we may not comprehend even as we read it today and even as I share it but it's so important that we gain spiritual insight today into what it means that you must be born again and so I pray that you would open our hearts our minds to look at this with fresh eyes as we pray in the power and the matchless name of Jesus Christ our Lord amen amen you know, what we can see in this passage from Nicodemus as a Pharisee, with all of his perks, with all of his knowledge, with all of his understanding of what it means to be a Pharisee, I think we can read into it that he has some unrest on the inside. He has some uncertainty about what is happening. Even in his position as a religious elite, he's not quite sure that that's enough. I mean, he has this full understanding and comprehension of what it means to keep the law under the old covenant and under the Jewish religion. But I don't, I don't think it's satisfying his inner yearning or his inner desire for God. And maybe that's where you find yourself this morning. 
Perhaps you have a knowledge, you have an understanding, but yet there's still something that you feel like it might be missing on the inside. Following laws could only satisfy the old covenant or the old law, not his inner yearning for Nicodemus. For only God's forgiveness and grace can provide that inner restlessness that we all experience in life before we come to the knowledge of what it means to be born again. So let's discover in this passage this morning some key thoughts as we pick it apart. And I want to point out as we look at Nicodemus, if we look at who he is, we look at his position and his power and his stature, and we look at where God may be taking him, the same can be true of us at times, and that is this, believing Believing is not enough. And I put it this way in your notes. Progress toward believing is not enough. Now what do you mean by that, Pastor? That, that, that our understanding of who Jesus is and beginning to believe that Jesus is God's Son and that He did come to earth, if that's where we're at, if that's all it is, is just a belief in who Jesus is, that's not enough. Notice in verse 2, when Nicodemus met the Lord, he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God. He acknowledged who Jesus is. He believed in who Jesus being someone from God who can do these signs. Otherwise, he couldn't do them if God was not behind it. But belief was not enough. We can see that in this passage. Yes, Jesus acknowledges that Nicodemus is a good man. Jesus acknowledges that he's religious, but perhaps not yet right with God. Could that be said of us this morning? You're a good person. You're a good woman. You're a good man. You're a good child of God. But are you right with him? Nicodemus knew he was right by law. For what? He had kept every one of them to the best of his ability down to the minor details but he was not under the grace of God yet. He was not right by God's mercy and his grace. And Jesus was offering Nicodemus what the law could not give. And that's what we begin to understand in this passage. Nicodemus, you have done everything you believe to be right under the law, but you're going to experience the grace and the forgiveness of God in a new way if you are born again. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, we see this idea that progress toward belief is not enough. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, I've read this passage many times in my life, and it always troubles me. It troubles me that there are those who believe that they are in a right position with God or a right position with Jesus, and yet he says there will be many that I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And I don't know if that troubles you this morning, but I, I think it should for all of us to recognize, am I in the position that God has called me to be in as Jesus says to be born again? I think there's many of people, many people, maybe millions of people in the world that consider themselves Christians. They're asked by the pollsters or the latest study, by Barner or whatever, are you Christian? And they're like, yeah, I identify as Christian. Well, why do you identify as Christian? because you live in this country or because your parents were Christians or whatever it may be. But I wonder how many have actually had the transforming power of God, born again conversion happen in their lives so that they are Christian. Or do many of them just call themselves Christians? Do many of them have their names written on the membership in a local church, but yet not truly a born again believer? Just because your name is on the membership of a role of the church does not guarantee that you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And being born again does not take place just because you believe in this Jesus. 
James talks about that, doesn't he? Chapter 2, verse 19. You believe there is one God? Good! But even the demons believe that. And they shudder. So if it's not just belief, what is it? What is this conversion experience of being born again? I mean, we use conversion or born, born again in our Christianese, our religious circles, and it usually implies the acceptance of a religious belief system. But for me, I wrote this for you today. The fundamental biblical meaning of what it means to be a Christian or to be born again or to have the conversion experience is this. Surrender to God and His Spirit through the cross of Jesus and His burial, resurrection from the dead. Surrender to God and his spirit through Jesus Christ, atoning sacrifice on the cross and his burial and resurrection from the dead. Which leads me to this understanding of what it means to be born again is that we are in the transformation process by God's spirit. Transformation by God's spirit is needed. That's what Jesus is talking about. There has to be this inner transformation through his spirit that takes place in our life. Look at verses 3 through 6 again. You know, rather than affirming Nicodemus' compliment, he went right to the heart of the matter here. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless what? They're born again. And they have this interaction, this question, sort of like I had with my high school teacher. Well, what's this mean, to be born again? You can't do it when you're old. Surely you can't enter your mother's womb a second time. And Jesus says you must be born of water and the Spirit. Now right there is... Let's not take this out of context. And some people like to say, this is the reason you have to be baptized. No, this, this idea of being born of water and spirit is, is the cleansing of our sin by water. And Jesus himself calls himself the living water. So it's this, this act or this process that happens. They're, they're connected. I mean, it would have been really easy for Jesus to say what? No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are baptized and the Holy Spirit is in them. So it's not about being baptized. It's about having the cleansing, washing of sin out of your life by the transformative power of the Spirit. And let me key in on power because that's what the Spirit gives you is the power to be different, the power to live this life on this earth with everything going on around us in a relationship with God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, our natural birth, but the Spirit gives birth to a spirit spirit that is different you should not be surprised by my saying Nicodemus you should get this you should understand this for the wind blows wherever it pleases and you hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going so it is with everyone born of the spirit do you have that transformative power of God's spirit in you because that's what's needed to truly considered born again by God that you acknowledge Jesus as your savior but there is something more happening in you to be born again with the newness of life that's in the Holy Spirit. It, it also means to be born from above because God's Spirit comes from above. Jesus said, I ascend so that another may descend and may live in you as you belong as a child of God and as you belong to the kingdom of God in heaven forever. How did Paul describe this new birth? this new idea of being transformed by God's Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he says what? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. A new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. Which leads me to think, and this is a tough question for us to ask of ourselves, am I different today than I was before I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord? And if I'm not different, what's up with that? Because the scripture clearly says we're to be different. The old is gone, the new has come. We're to be transformed by God's spirit. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can this idea of being born again happen? Which I believe Nicodemus understood. Jesus says you, you can't be good enough to enter the kingdom of God on your own and by keeping all of these rules and regulations. He literally said what? You must start over. You must have a new place of origin. You must spring from a different life. And Nicodemus probably thinks Jesus has gone too far here. 
I mean, people really can't start over. People really can't claim a new life, can they? I mean, people can't really enjoy a new beginning. I think most of us, we face moments where we wish we could, right? We wish we could go back and do things differently, start over. Mickey and I have talked about this a little, a little bit lately as parents. I mean, we wish we could go back and do some things differently. I think we all do as we look back at our lives. At least we could expunge some of our worst sins or our worst faults. What happened here is Nicodemus heard only born again in the physical sense, and he's missing the spiritual idea, the spiritual concept of what it means to be born by God's Spirit from above. Each of us who is born in the flesh will die. Each of us who is born of the water and the Spirit, God's cleansing, forgiveness, power will live forever. That's what's required, Jesus says, if people are to see and enter the kingdom of God. Paul put it this way in Galatians chapter 5. Paul said, so I say walk by the Spirit, and you will what? Not gratify the desires of the flesh, this earthly living. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. You see, they're in conflict with each other. What are human flesh desires and needs are in conflict with what the spiritual requires so that you are not you are not to do whatever you want but if you're led by the spirit you're not under the law Nicodemus it's not about the law it's not about the rules and regulations it's about a relationship with the living God through the transforming power of his spirit and being being led by the Holy Spirit is at the heart of the Christian life and that's what it means for us to have a born-again experience so that we will enter the kingdom of heaven. So how does this happen? Now I'll share it with you this morning in your notes, what I call the triple A. Triple A to be born again. First is admit my sin. Every one of us must admit our sin, our own wrongdoings, our own mistakes, our own faults, and Romans is going to tell us in verse 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means not one of us. Not one of us has done what is necessary to keep the law. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But 10, 9 also says what? If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. It means you believe in your heart, you say it out loud with your mouth, Jesus is Lord of my life, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not maybe saved or possibly saved, but it begins with admitting your sin. The second A is asking God for forgiveness and repenting. God, I'm sorry for what I've done. God, I know that I've done some things in your sight that are terrible. And you ask God for his forgiveness, which he freely offers to anyone who asks. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, what does it say? God is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, and we repent. Repent literally means to turn around and go in the opposite direction, to not do those things that I once used to do in the old self because I am a new creation. And then the third part of this AAA is allow Christ to lead your life. And often I think that's where we fall short. We've admitted our sin, we've asked God for forgiveness, and we've repented in some way, but we've not allowed him to lead our life. We're still holding on. I'm in control. I'm going to determine where I go. I'm going to decide what happens in my life. And God's saying, no, allow me through Christ and the Spirit to lead you. John 8, 12, Jesus spoke of this when he talked to the people and he said, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world, full devotion. Whoever follows me, you'll never walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. 
You see, there's a reason that Jesus called it being born again because it is a new beginning and it is a transformative process. It's life transforming. We're different than we used to be. When you're born again, you love the things you once hated and you hate the things you once loved. When you're born again, you live for the things you once avoided and you avoid the things that you used to live for. That's the difference. That's what it means. Nicodemus, do you understand this? And he says to us this morning, do you understand this? To admit your sin, to ask for forgiveness, and to allow Christ to lead your life. And then as we finish out this passage of Scripture this morning, this thought. Therefore, number three, we are witnesses of what we know and have seen. You and I are witnesses to what we know about Jesus Christ and what we have seen him do in our lives. Verse 10 and 11, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you're Israel's teacher I mean, you're the guy. You are the one that understands all of this knowledge and understanding. And yet you don't get it. You don't understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. Once again, understanding Nicodemus represented the best of religious knowledge and understanding. Yet he did not understand and he should have. I mean, can that be said of us today? We've gone to church, we've read our Bibles, we've been in a church maybe our entire lives, but do we truly understand what Jesus is saying to be born again, to have God's Spirit transform our lives? I mean, do you understand it, knowledge up here, and that's it? Or is it something more? Is there something more to what Christ has done in your life? Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, this goes along with our theme for the year of being the light. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Transformative power of the Spirit in our lives gives us both a knowledge and and an understanding of what God has done in our lives so that as we go out those doors and as we live in our community and in our world, our workplace, our school, or wherever it may be, we're different than the world around us. And people will see that difference. We are witnesses to Christ's light living in us and through us. And if they're not seeing that, once again, I ask the question, what's wrong? What are we missing? Witnesses are so important to testify to the truth. Very truly, I tell you, the truth that we understand, the truth that we live out, makes a difference in the world around us. You know, a couple weeks ago, I got that lovely piece of mail that no one likes to get in their daily mail. Anybody know what that one is? Jury duty. I had to call in Friday night. I have to call in tomorrow. I have to call in Tuesday. My number's a little bit on, so I'm hoping maybe they don't call me or whatever. But if you get into that position, being on a jury, witnesses, witnesses are still one of the most important pieces of evidence to whether a person can be found guilty or proven innocent. Yeah, there's DNA. There's circumstantial stuff, but witnesses are still so vital. How's your witness for Jesus Christ in the world around you that is, in essence, the jury looking to see is what's in your DNA, the Spirit of God transforming you as a Christian in the world in which we live, or are you just pretty much like everybody else? Don't see much difference. You know, I tried to find out the origin of this, the origin of this uh, phrase I'm about to give you, and, and maybe it's out there, and I just didn't find it. I've heard it said many times and tried to look to see. I know it's quoted by Billy Graham. I'm not sure if he's the one that originally gave it to us or whoever else, but it's in your notes. It's this idea I want to make sure you know before you leave today. If you're born once, 
you'll die twice. If you're born twice, you'll die once, or maybe never, if Jesus returns. The second coming of Christ happens before you die an earthly death. What that simply means, if you're born just once as a physical birth, you're going to die both on this earth when life is over, and you're going to die eternally separated from God. And I don't want that for anybody. But if you're born twice, born both a physical birth and a spiritual rebirth in Christ, born of the water and the spirit that Jesus talks about, you're only going to die once, amen? And maybe not even once. I would love for that to happen. (laughs) Not have to go through death. David and Becky, I know I was with you and your dad over these last week or so. You watched the physical deterioration of a person and how difficult that is for someone, your loved one to go through. I don't want to go through that. I don't think anybody really does. And maybe, just maybe, God will not tarry and he'll return and we won't have to even die once. That would be pretty awesome. But if I have to, and I know I may, it'll only be once. Because I know I've truly been born again. God's Spirit lives in me. I allow Him to lead my life. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean I don't still mess up. It doesn't mean I don't sin. But it means the grace of God covers me in the midst of that sin or that mistake. And each day I say, God, lead me in the way that you would want me to go. We look at people in the scriptures and they messed up, didn't they? God used a lot of ordinary, messed up people to change the world. Our kids were telling me about some of those people on Wednesday night in our kids' ministry. It's really amazing to spend some time with the kids and get their perspective and hear about Abraham and Noah, Moses, Jesus, and others. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. My question to you this morning is, have you truly, have you truly been born again? Let's pray together. Father, I know at times these words that we read in Scripture are hard for us to understand as they were for Nicodemus. Just like it was hard for me to understand what my sophomore English teacher was showing me, and and even after he showed me, I still didn't get it. Because it had never been, I'd never used that item. It had never been applied to my life. And maybe that's true for some of us here this morning when we think about who Jesus is as the Son of God who died on a cross for the forgiveness of our sin, who was buried, who was raised three days later. We, we believe, but progress toward belief is not enough. It has to be implemented into our lives, our daily living. And it comes with the AAA, admitting and asking and allowing God, to do a transforming work in us through the power of his spirit. If that's you this morning and and, and you've never understood it, you've never truly got it, but today God is saying to you, my child, you understand. You've got the opportunity now for a new beginning. Do over, start over. All those mistakes, all those things that you've done, they can be erased. You must be born again, born of water, born of the spirit of God. So we come today, and the prayer, in some form, is what I've laid out. God, I admit my sin. Say that to him this morning. You admit your sin. The things you've done that you know are wrong. You also ask for God's forgiveness. And you repent. And God will wash you clean with the living water. And then because we do believe in Christ and who he is, we allow him to lead our life. Not just Savior, but Savior and Lord. Directing our path, directing our steps, directing our words, directing our actions, directing our thoughts, directing how we love other people, directing how we love our spouse, how we love our kids directing how we interact with people at work and at school and in our neighborhood and wherever it may be. And we're different people than we used to be because the old is gone, the new has come. 
God, my prayer, you know, as I've shared it, is that we could be a light to the world around us, that this church could be an igni- something that ignites uh, a, a newness in our world today in people's lives. You know, I, I read online last night, Vietnam, a country I visited 13 years ago, I believe now, is experiencing crusades with the Billy Graham Association and, and, and tens of thousands of people not hundreds of thousands of people are coming together to hear the gospel proclaimed. We know in other parts of the world the gospel is bringing the good news to people who understand and who are giving their life to Christ, and yet here in our country the gospel has come to people who understand, and yet, I don't know, is it our comfortability? Is it because we're comfortable in our life like Nicodemus? You know, we have our power, we have our position, we have our respect, we have our, our status quo, and we don't want to lose any of that. When Jesus says, come to me and surrender everything, and we are transformed and we give of our finances differently, we give of ourselves differently, our time and our talents, and we, we treat people differently, and we reach to those who are struggling and hurting and those who are in poverty and sickness or whatever it may be, do we not want to give that up? Is that why we're quote unquote stubborn like Nicodemus? I don't know where you're at this morning. Only God knows that. But I don't want you to walk out these doors today without having the opportunity to say, today is the day that I truly want to acknowledge to be born again, that I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I ask him to lead me in my life if that's you this morning then before we end this service I encourage you just to stand up where you're at now and to make your way down the aisle on the outside or or the middle aisle wherever it may be I know that may be a little scary cause you some anxiety but Jesus says if you declare me before men I will declare you before my father it's God moving in your heart this morning that you would be that person to Stay, say today's the day. This is it, my new beginning. March 12th, 2023. God, may your spirit move in the hearts of your people. As I said earlier, being a member of a church doesn't make you a Christian, but maybe that's your decision today. I want to be a member of this church. I want to be a part of what's happening here, and I haven't made that step yet. I haven't made that decision. Is that you this morning? Step out and walk forward. Maybe it's, I want to be baptized. I know baptism doesn't save me. We don't believe that. We're saved through the grace of Jesus Christ, but I haven't been baptized yet, and I want that symbolic experience so that other people know I'm a witness. I'm going to testify to what I now know and what I've seen God do in my life. Maybe you want to be baptized. I invite you to come. Jesus said you must be born again. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once maybe not even that God thank you for our time of worship together this morning we acknowledge your presence we acknowledge your spirit we acknowledge your transformative work in our lives and in the life of this church and may we be a church that after the service ends we linger a little bit longer to share with other people what you're doing in our lives may we be a church that shares our times and our talents and our treasures with others so they may see a witness and we testify to the light May we be a church that is sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we leave and go out the doors. Now may God's grace, his abundant mercy, and his forgiveness rest upon all of you in the fellowship as believers in Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Those of you joining us online, those of you who are here in a worship service, we'll see you again next week. God bless you.